Hey, Will, how are you? <laughs> you should have kept the bandana, Will. I don't think he can hear you yet. Will, you should have kept the bandana. <laughs> You're muted, but I appreciate the gesture. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Lopez, thank you for joining us. Hey, Will, you're looking good, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Will, over a year ago, if you'd worn that bandana up like that, people thought you'd just been out robbing a stagecoach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all as, as more people join, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today for um, this exciting panel and um, uh, uh, talk uh, with uh, Mr. Alan Crane. Um, we're going to talk today, the event title is The Rise of AI in International Arbitration. And uh, Mr. Crane is uniquely positioned to talk about that issue as he is the chairman of the board of a company that is um, front and center um, in this industry and with legal applications um, in artificial intelligence. The company's name is Arbitrator Intelligence. And um, I'll go through his um, very, very long and accomplished bio in, in a bit. Um, but before that, I just want to do, give a little preface to folks and lay a little bit of groundwork um, as to um, you know, what AI is, number one, um, for, for those that may be technically challenged um, in that regard, and then also how AI generally has been used um, to date in the legal industry um, and what some of the pros and cons have been. Um, and then I'll turn it over to um, Alan, who um, has a presentation set up for us. Um, and uh, he'll go through what his company, Arbitrator Intelligence, does and the experience that they've had um, uh, so far. So in general, uh, when we're talking about um, our, uh, um, artificial intelligence, um, that's a term that's kind of coined to describe the general process whereby large amounts of data are combined um, with iterative you know, processing and algorithms that enable the software itself to learn automatically from patterns or features in the data. And that's gonna be important uh, to remember in the context of legal applications of AI um, because the, typically the, you know, the formula is the more data, the better uh, that the uh, artificial intelligence will be able to predict um, outcomes. And so, um, you know, the term AI is often used loosely and, in, and it can encompass many subjects, including machine learning, deep learning, even neural pathways, as we get into um, neuro um, applications of artificial intelligence, um, natural language processing as well. Um, but generally, we're talking about the software's ability to learn automatically from patterns or features in the data, and that's what makes it intelligent. And so um, AI has been um, for a while, whether you've noticed or not, been applied in, in the legal context. And I think, um, especially for litigators and, and those in dispute resolution in general, um, that's been mostly in discovery um, where you use programs like Relativity um, or other document discovery software which apply artificial intelligence or at, at the very least basic algorithms in helping you determine what's relevant and what's not um, for your particular case. Um, um, some of that may be happening in the background, some of it may be more explicit in, in the parameters that you set, um, but by and large, um, that's been kind of the historical application of artificial intelligence when it comes to um, dispute resolution. Um, today, uh, AI has morphed and become a lot more varied in its, in its applications and, and use in um, international dispute resolution. Um, it's number one, used um, increasingly with, uh, to, to apply to vast amounts of digital uh, micro data that, that's held by parties and their counsel in order to determine what's relevant to the case and then to analyze that data and present it in a more effective manner. Um, and so this use of AI um, to process micro data helps, you know, obviously with, uh, with cost and, and time issues. Um, and, um, you know, it eventually will help solve the problem um, as, you know, as people might expect, um, you know, which, which goes from automating manual processes that become digitized. Um, but the, the gateway to having these benefits is having access to these systems. 
And uh, that's been a concern that um, some experts have had uh, with applications of AI in dispute resolution, which has been access to these softwares. So um, depending on what their price points might be um, and uh, you know, just general access to them, uh, there are concerns of whether um, there, there will be an uneven playing field um, between, let's say, you know, a individual plaintiff um, going up against a corporation who has the means and the funds to pay for um, the artificial intelligence, whereas the, the, you know, for example, the plaintiff may not. And so there are those access to justice issues. Um, in addition, there have been um, increasing concerns um, about um, the confidenti confidentiality and, and personal data protection. Um, in the context of international arbitration, uh, there's a unique spin to this because generally one of the hallmark features of international commercial arbitration has been um, the, uh, the fact that arbitral awards are not disclosed. Um, of course, there are exceptions to that depending on the arbitral forum, but by, by and large, that's been the case. And, um, and so that creates this tension between um, AI's need for the data um, and um, and the you know the um, the the requirement or the, the rules in place that prevent the disclosure of those arbitral awards. Um, you know, com Alan could speak more about this. Um, and co companies like Arbitrator Intelligence have um, have worked on developing various surveys and various ways of collecting data and and even collecting the arbitral awards themselves that have been made available. Um, to um, to create data sets and uh, feed that into um, the AI um, that that they run um, for various purposes. Um, so today, um, AI not only is applied to discovery, um, but is is applied to selecting arbitrators, which is um, one of the services that um, arbitrator intelligence um, provides that Alan can talk about. Um, it's applied to even predicting outcomes um, in, in various cases. Um, and, and can even simulate um, how a mediation or negotiation uh, would go in, in resolving a dispute. Um, so uh, AI is certainly becoming increasingly complex um, and in an age where um, uh, regardless of profession, folks are worried about robots and, and software and computers replacing them, um, you know, lawyers may have the same questions of whether we're headed towards an age where AI is going to replace, um, you know, uh, legal advocacy and and um, and uh, and adjudication. And you know, I I think we're far from that at this point. Um, and uh, you know, I'd love to know Alan's thoughts <laughs> about that based on his experience. Um, and uh, and if any of you have um, any insights in that regard, we'd love your feedback as well. So. Um, the, you know, all, uh, before I start on Alan's bio, just a quick note, if you do have uh, questions um, that you'd like to pose um, to us throughout this discussion, um, please feel free. There's a chat feature um, in Zoom. Um, you can send me uh, just privately um, a message or generally to everyone, doesn't matter, uh, w w with your question and I'll, um, I'll be collecting those throughout and um, either posing them um, to Alan during our discussion, or we can reserve some time at the end. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, so with that, I'd like to formally introduce um, our speaker today, um, Alan Crane. Um, he is the chairman of the board of Arbitrator Intelligence and uh, was the chairman of the board of EP Energy as well. Um, he's also served as an arbitrator for over 30 years, and he's currently a director and the chairman of the governance committee of the National Association of Corporate Directors, Te Texas Tri-Cities chapter. Um, he's a lecturer at the Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice, um, and he's a member of the board of directors of uh, various other um, oil services type companies. Um, he's also um, had a lot of involvement in, in international affairs, especially as it relates to Houston. Um, he's on the boards of the World Affairs Council of Houston, uh, the Asia Society, the American Arbitration Association, uh, the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, um, and multiple other organizations dedicated to protecting human rights. Um, in, in his previous life, Mr. Crane was a senior vice president, chief legal and governance officer of Baker Hughes um, until his retirement at the end of December 2016. Um, and uh, prior to that, he was general counsel of Crown Cork and Seal Company and GC of Union Texas Petroleum Holdings. Um, earlier than that, he was a lawyer with Pennzoil and with El Paso LNG. Um, he's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has served on the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights 
Um, he graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnical, a Polytechnic Institute with uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering and received his MBA and JD from Syracuse. But more important than any of these accomplishments is the fact that he was also the chair of the Houston Bar Association International Law Section. Um, and I'm proud to follow in his footsteps. So thank you, Alan, for, for joining us today. And um, I'll hand it over to you uh, with a question first as I set up your PowerPoint. Um, but before we get to that, just a quick question. What has been your um, historical, prior to arbitrator intelligence, what has been your historical involvement um, with AI in, in the various um, uh, you know, um, legal careers that you've had? Right. Well, as you said, I've got, thank you, Sipan. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad you left the uh, most important to last, the chairmanship <laughs> was, uh, um, part of the Houston Bar. So that was my earliest uh, foray in that regard. Um, you know, I'm an engineer, I have a bachelor's in engineering and a master's degree in engineering. My master's project actually was around computerization of all the records uh, dealing with uh, preventive maintenance for all the, the um, services and equipment at Vassar Brothers Hospital, which is right next to Vassar College. So I spent an entire summer there uh, doing that. And that was a very um, manual process. I mean, you can program things and put it in. and Law, I didn't see computers again, frankly, being used very much and particularly in an AI kind of related way. And frankly, AI hasn't really been around that long relative to how long computers have been used now. But those of us like David Lopez, I'm sure David remembers when uh, Westlaw and Lexus came out, you could start doing searches by computer using Boolean logic where you would use you know, the keywords, statute of limitations and within 10, 25 words, tolling, if you wanted to look that up, instead of shepherdizing by hand, which was always enough to make me feel suicidal, frankly. So I'm just glad I didn't have to do that once I got off of the law review, or graduated, I guess, from law school. But today, um, I think you said the most important words around AI, which is big data, because we have the big data, and we have the computing power to go with it, and the iterative process, which allows programming to be done, which provides um, iterations, in which you can have learning. So in the learning process, um, you mentioned I was chairman of the board of EP Energy uh, for three years. And during that period, which is, I stopped that in October when we took the company back um, private from being a public company. Uh, during that time, uh, EP Energy, which is a very small company, but very active in Texas and in Utah. In Texas, all the land records, except for one county are available online. And they were using a program to suck up the data, fill up um, the information they wanted, and be able to look at everybody's lease positions, what was up, what was going on, and save so much time and so much money. Uh, very valuable. So, you know, AI can be used, computers can be used, big data can be used in ways to do things that you already do, do them better, cheaper, faster. But AI in particular can allow us to do things that we haven't been able to do before. So you're talking about pre predictive analytics. And I think that's one that has a lot of um, um, way to go. I don't think it will replace people. You mentioned lawyers being replaced by machines. I think it can improve, frankly, what we do. Um, today, uh, we all spend a lot of time, because that's the nature of what we have to do, deal doing a lot of data stuff, doing a lot of information, doing a lot of administrative things. Um, if you have a really great administrative assistant who works with you, they can cut down on that for you. But the thing we all like to do most is use our minds. And artificial intelligence can help us get information that we need to use our minds more. You mentioned deep learning, um, you know, the deep learning of the computers where they go through so many iterations, get so much information used in things like facial recognition because you really need a lot of data there. Um, you know, there's, there's good things and bad things, I'd, I'd say, that can come out of deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence and maybe facial recognition being used in certain countries, such as China, is not necessarily being used in a good way, but that's true with most advances in technology. Um, we, we agreed today, and you, su you suggested, you know, I talk about arbitrator intelligence. So let me give a little background on arbitrator intelligence. And arbitrator intelligence was started as a nonprofit by Catherine Rogers, professor at Penn State Law School and at uh, Queen Mary. And she's, uh, for those of you in arbitration, I, I know uh, many of you on the line, I know you, you know Catherine, how highly regarded she is. 
And she saw it as, as a public good. You know, create arbitrator intelligence uh, with the idea that, and as I go through the uh, presentation, let's put the presentation up in yep. a second. Yeah, go ahead and put it up. That's good. Why don't we go through this and then we can go back and do other things and take questions as well. Sure. And send questions anytime. Um, Sipan will be looking for them and he'll bring them up with me. So arbitrator intelligence, as we say, it's state-of-the-art analytics about international arbitrators. So it's now a for-profit company. It's for-profit. The drive for that was to get the data and process the data. Catherine realized she needed to have um, so many people working on this that you had to raise money to do it. You weren't going to get the money as a nonprofit to do it. And it, fortunately, being at Penn State, they have a big incubator for startups. And she went to them and worked with them. And they thought this was a great idea, a good business idea, a very good business idea because of the potential market and everything. So we are actually um, getting money right now from private investors. I'm an investor now. Uh, originally, I was not an investor. I was invited to go on the board when it was a nonprofit. I think it's a great thing because the, of the fundamental um, mission of, of the, and I'll talk about that as we go through the slides. But let me tell you what arbitrator intelligence does, and then I'll come back and give you a little bit more on the history and, and where it's going. So probably everybody on here, because you're all part of the international uh, legal groups, um, know why do you have um, international arbitration? Well, you want it to be enforceable, obviously. You want independence in the decision maker. You don't want to be subject to the local courts. And you get the specialized expertise. You can choose arbitrators who have the background. And most of the cases I hear are now in, in the energy industry, although for years I stayed away from those because I didn't want to have conflicts. And I, when I was working, I'd take cases and only one or two a year and give the money to charity over. Um, so I heard lots of construction cases, just lots of general contract cases of all sorts, mostly international because I could pick and choose. Um, but you can choose the arbitrators who have expertise. And that's one of the ways arbitration originally, originally came about. It should be, um, and they will be independent, as I said, of the course, should be faster. That's something we all work on all the time. I'm chairing a uh, non-administered uh, CPR arbitration, had a first preliminary call, preliminary hearing uh, yesterday, and was emphasizing to uh, at least one side, but really both sides, that th those rules particularly focus on uh, speed and efficiency and not making it look like litigation. That's stated in, in the preamble to those particular rules. So, and that helps drive down costs, efficiency and uh, economics. Confidentiality, of course, uh, CPAN mentioned confidentiality. And I'll come back to that as I go through the rest of the presentation. Of course, one of the great things we know about, and particularly as a general counsel, you know, when you have lots of uh, arbitrations and litigations, that's not your business. You know, for those of you on the phone, like Will and Tim and everybody else, this is your business, uh, litigating, arbitrating cases for people. But that's not the general counsel's business. That's not the company's business. So finality is great that you're not going to have appeals and go forward. And over time, it's like building a portfolio. Uh, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. And hopefully you anticipate which ones you're going to win and lose and you settle the ones you're going to lose for less than you'll lose them for or take them to arbitration and resolve them for less than the other side would win for and you're still happy. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the challenge in arbitration? Confidentiality is one of the benefits, but the secret, uh, the, ar the ar arbitration information is secret. You know, what's going on in the arbitration? Why don't you hit this again? I think there's a second part comes up on it. Okay, secret, secret, secret. There we go. Oh, that's okay. So how do people handle this? And in fact, I'm um, on another arbitration with a, a well-known arbitrator and we're choosing a chair, which I thought we had done yesterday and uh, we're still trying on that. But because arbitrator intelligence only has so much inventory, and I'll talk about that, and it's primarily for big cases so far, although international cases everywhere, um, people are still using the same thing they've used forever is it's low tech. You call other people, you know, I'm, I've talked to Will before, I've talked to uh, Tim, I've talked to others on this call about, you know, I've got this kind of case, who do you know who's had this kind of case was, and you talk and you get lots of things, I keep a database myself, but, I'm going to go to the next slide. What arbitrator intelligence does uh, that's different is to, uh, it allows us to use our proprietary analytics um, for the benefit of firms and clients for companies to pick the best arbitrator. And what we do is we have something called the AIQ. You can see it in the slide all the way on the left, the arbitra arbitrator intelligence questionnaire. And we get these filled out and they're very detailed. And parties and counsel fill them out. Arbitrators, we don't allow arbitrators to fill them out because arbitrators have a strict duty of confidentiality. 
we don't own anything. That's not our data. That's not our information. What we decide in the case is not, not ours either. So we should not ever be talking about cases. And um, I don't talk about cases at all, frankly, except to the amount I just did. I won't tell you the other arbitrators I sit with. I won't tell you any of the parties who've ever appeared before me. I won't tell you anything about the issues because that's not my right. But the parties in council can submit case details and it's on a redacted basis. So they still can't identify the cases. And we have our unique data analytics and we look at the arbitrators track records and we build data case by case as arbitrators hear cases, case by case and the council evaluations and our analytics are filled in and the data we get from council and, uh, and uh, well, from the council and the parties is examined by lawyers. So, you know, if chambers or people who rate other groups, I won't say other ones who claim they um, have listings of arbitrators, they have people who are, have administrative backgrounds and collect data, they get the data, but they can't really analyze it and they don't get the kind of data we get. So that's what's one of the unique things about what we have, and I won't go into that more because it is proprietary, a lot of it. Um, and then we have an electronic, going to the last part on the right, electronic interactive single use reports. So that means if you have an arbitration, like the arbitrations I'm having right now, but the, well, one's international, the other one's domestic, um, and we don't add arbitrator intelligence, we don't yet have a database big enough to fill up some of the arbitrators I want to see. Um, but if I can go, when I can go and get those, or in the international situation, which you can with arbitrator intelligence now, look at, particularly in certain countries, and we'll talk about that, get information on arbitrators you may not even know exist, and get detailed background, it's, it's objective data, and it's comparable data. So you can look at the data on two or three different arbitrators, and, and I gave the example of uh, the old Boolean logic, like for looking for statute of limitations, in connection with toll, tolling. If your best defense is statute of limitations, you'd really like to know if the, some of the arbitrators that are available, one you might pick has ever allowed that and had a case dismissed on dispositive motion early on on statute of limitations versus what many panels do, many tribunals, and say, well, we'll consider that at the end. Consider it at the end uh, doesn't really, uh, in my mind, uh, fit with the idea of being most efficient if you have a good, something like something that's dispositive, it should be heard early. And I'll go on a little bit of a tangent. In March, the ICDR, or around March, they haven't officially announced, the ICDR will issue their new rules for the ICDR. I've been on that uh, group. We have a small committee. I've been working on that, very international committee. Last week, we did a, uh, a program uh, for the ICDR about the new rules. And one of the rules, which I was the one who wrote, is on dispositive motions. So, on, and how that'll be handled in a fair, equal manner, but allow dispositive motions to be considered in appropriate circumstances and be ruled on, which will make it more efficient, make things happen more quickly in the appropriate cases and the, with the balancing on being sure all the parties have a fair and full opportunity to be heard. Uh, but to give that example, why don't we go to the next slide, please, see Pam. So this, here's a sample report. It doesn't show you the whole report, obviously. And even on my screen is very small, but I know this report very well. So the uh, arbitrator who's mentioned here or, or is outlined here and just some of the data that we have is uh, from Peru, if I recall, this one's the right one from Peru, who is very, very well known in Peru. He's one of the person, people. But if you have an arbitration that involves uh, Peru in some way, you probably won't know this person. You may not hear from him by calling me or somebody else. Now, if you call me, I'll tell you to go to Arbitrator Intelligence because you get a lot of data. But had you called me um, six months ago and asked arbitrators I know in Peru, I don't think I could say I knew any at that time. So that's the kind of uh, data that we get, or uh, I'm not telling you much about the data. You can go to Arbitrator Intelligence and you can look and you can actually look at the sample report, I believe, uh, still. Uh, if not, let me know and I think I can find a way that you can do it um, so that you get an idea of what all the data is uh, that you can see. And, and one of the big things is, you know, you, we, well, you're going to have to look at the data because I don't, there's so much in it that you go in and look at it and you'll see the charts and, and what have you. And as we build and we're building this database, we have um, just a couple hundred people in it now, and that's not where we want to be, obviously. So that's why we had to go become a for public company, and there's a great value in this company, and that'll be uh, realized over time. But right now, we're going with the, the fundamental issues we always had and the fundamental mission. And I'll talk about that in just a little. While. Why don't we go to the next slide, please? Um, well, this comes back to the same thing. You know, what's the current two-sided market? Two-sided market, um, 
what we're saying, if you, if you look at right now, the parties, it's the upper part, current information exchange. You're calling one another. Parties who need it, parties who have it. So you get a two-sided market. What we do is we go to the parties who have the data, who are on the left side here, and they get the, we get them to fill out the AIQ. If, if they become a member, so if a law firm becomes a member, we have many, we have many law firms who are members, some of whom uh, we publicly disclose on the website. I won't say who they are because I don't remember which ones are public and which ones are confidential. Many of the law firms um, have chosen not to disclose that they're uh, using our service. And I think that's they consider it a competitive uh, uh, advantage. Don't necessarily want somebody else on the other side to know that they're getting the data. And we respect that and we respect their privacy. It's true with some of the corporations who have signed up. But anyway, if, if you sign up uh, because you have arbitrations, you will pro provide us with AIQs, then you get a, a sliding discount based on how you do that. So it's actually the, um, as we say, a two-sided market because from time to time, you know, as a general counsel, we were, um, we had data because we were in arbitrations and therefore we could fill out AIQs. And I won't say whether Baker Hughes is or is not because I don't remember their um, public status. Um, and this came up after I left Baker Hughes anyway. The, uh, so I didn't cause that to happen. Um, but anyway, and from time to time, we need to know who arbitrators are. So what we do, obviously, is I think I've said, you, know, you can get reports, you pay, you pay money in to get reports, depending on what you pay, is, is depending on whether or not you're participating in helping to fill up the information base about all the arbitrators. Why don't we go to the next slide? So I can take questions if people have questions on this. This is the one I really want to get to because, um, go back one, sorry. Um, this is what the whole idea of arbitrator intelligence arose out of. Um, it's more transparency to arbitration. Transparency that's not going to be problematic to general counsels like myself who don't want all our arbitrations to be known. Particularly when you're in a service business, you don't necessarily want, um, you know, some of the oil companies to know that you're, you've brought arbitrations against the other oil companies because they're not doing whatever you felt contractually they should do because that's just not good business in general. Um, but lots of those go on and confidentiality is important in that regard. But transparency is good for the market for a number of reasons. We also believe, and, and we know this is true, and I'll give you some data on this too later. Uh, later. Um, accountability, arbitrators who know that the parties are going to be um, filling out an AIQ because we ask a lot about the, uh, the whole process, the speed of the process, the depth of the process, uh, the approach, the philosophy of the process, and how good was the decision, how clear, well was it written, et cetera. Um, we believe, and I think it's pretty clear, that arbitrators knowing that their uh, decisions, their reason awards will be available in some form or at least it'll be rated by people, um, the accountability will be much greater than it has been. Let me put it that way. And, and last, but certainly not least, uh, diversity. Diversity and inclusion is a big driver of this. There are, as long as I've been involved in international arbitration, which goes more than 35 years, actually goes uh, 40 years next year, I realize, um, an ICC case. But anyway, the, there's always been the club. It used to be 40 years ago, it was an all male club. Um, today, it's an all-male and female club, frankly. Uh, there's still not a lot of diversity uh, in it. And there are lots of great people who have great experience as arbitrators. Once we get AIQs on them, you'll be able to find people by searching in different ways who you might not even know exist and who have absolutely the right background. And we think this will help a great deal in adding to the diversity and inclusion of who serves on arbitrations and who has the value to contribute um, by increasing the access to the critical information about arbitrators. It's objective data and comparable data. So this is very important uh, to us and uh, I think key, not only to making it work and making arbitrator intelligence successful, but making international arbitration fairer and much, much better in terms of the uh, decision-making and, uh, uh, and accountability and transparency. Why don't we go to the next slide? I think the next slide is just, uh, Okay, and then uh, skip over. I'll just give you some uh, snippets from uh, press coverage and testimonials, testimonials that we had, that was my word. Um, so in the Global Legal Post, which I think is a UK publication, uh, the highlighted section shows they came out and were talking about, um, you know, legal tech and what have you and litigation, et cetera. But 
they talk about Kluwer and Vaxlas, and Arbitrator Intelligence. So they actually, we have a joint venture with them. If you're, a, if you get certain, get certain kinds, get certain kinds, get certain kinds of information from them, you can actually, at the current time, it's sort of an intro opportunity, intro opportunity, you can get some, um, look at our arbitrator intelligence, uh, AI cues on people. So if you are engaged in arbitration and you want to see if we have one around somebody you're interested in or learn of people that you don't know previously, you can do that with them. So anyway, they're a big backer of ours. We're on it. We have one joint venture with them. They're interested in doing other things, whether we do that with them or do them alone or do them with someone else, we haven't decided at this point because there's so many, um, ten, uh, not tangential, but associated activities that we have, particularly on predictive analytics and other things that uh, will come in, in time. Let's go to the next one. I'm not sure if we can see Pam. Uh, well, this is the National Law Journal 2020 Emerging Legal Technologies. And we were identified as one of the top 50 uh, legal innovations in that. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, Law 360 has done articles about us. Um, the ICC, ICCA um, has, um, well, these are, you can read what they say actually about them, but we have support and UNSA trials, very, very interested. Um, actually, Canada, I think we've just disclosed, maybe it's next week. So anyway, Canada's uh, signed up. Uh, we have a country signed up as a member who will be providing us with information and buying AIQs from us. And we are in discussion with a number of other countries. I don't know that they'll all be able to be public or wish to be public the way Canada is. Um, but you can see, um, and, and we don't just do investment arbitrations, actually we do more private commercial arbitration and build the AIQs on them. Let's go to the next slide, which I think is next to last. Yeah, um, so Gary Bourne, um, anybody involved in international arbitration has heard of Gary Bourne, um, and usually quotes, he gets quoted every um, time I'm speaking at any arbitration, international arbitration. I've known Gary for years. I usually send him an email and say, somebody just quoted you again. And he's, he's very self-disparaging. He, uh, he's very funny what he usually says back. Anyway, he was one of the original directors as well, but it was a nonprofit. He's not on the for-profit board. We have a very small for-profit board, just three of us. Um, but he, Gabrielle kaufman Kohler, who you probably know, I'd say she's part of the good old boy, good old boy, uh, good old boy, good old girl club today. But we have a, a great uh, representation all around the world with great diversity. And by, I don't know if you all know Kendi Johnson, but he's um, one of the premier people in Africa. And we actually have a great database for building on African arbitrators and people involved in international arbitration in Africa. And go to the next slide, I think it's the last uh, one, which is just a placeholder. Yeah. So Arbitrator Intelligence, if you want to learn more, um, go to arbitratorintelligence.com and look through the website, look at the information that we have there. And I think you'll find um, a great deal of interesting information. And I mentioned predictive analytics. That's not something we're doing now, but because we're using big data, um, I want to be careful because a lot of things that we're doing right now are proprietary, but, but we are focused primarily still on building the inventory of arbitrators that we have AIQs on. Every time they hear a case, we hope to get a new additional um, set of AIQs on them from various parties who are involved with that arbitration and continue to build that database up. And with that database and other databases we're building around both the commercial cases, uh, the um, investor state arbitrations and other data sources. Um, we're going to have something, we do have something already that's uh, unique in that it is uh, objective data and it is comparable across um, different data sources or across different potential arbitrators. Well, let me stop there and we can uh, take questions on that. But I, th I thought I also, frankly, I want to talk about some other things related, not just international arbitration, but related uh, to the practice of law and you know how do you decide um i think of people on the call i don't I'm look at the other names there may be other people on the call who are in-house and could give you some sense could give us all some sense of you know what they're looking at right now in terms of legal tech and legal tech and artificial intelligence in particular but as a general counsel of three fortune 500 companies um uh, i can tell you that you know as i said earlier it's a business so you have to justify uh, within the confines of that, particularly as a general counsel, you have to be an advocate for why we need more money, why we need more lawyers, whatever we need, why it's good for the company, why it's good for the stockholders. The stockholders are our ultimate clients as uh, lawyers who represent organizations. And therefore you have to think like a business person 
and look at things. So lots of uh, uptake on legal tech items uh, can be slow just because if it's something to do, you know, if a company is already doing something, if a legal department, whether it's in a firm or if it's in a company is doing something one way right now, an organization can come to them and say, well, I've got a legal tech product that can do that for you faster, better, cheaper. Okay. So tell me about the cost, the faster, and the, et cetera. And tell me about the better, because how much better is it going to be? And then there's always a switching cost. People have to get to, to learn how to do it. And there's an investment cost. You've got a capital cost and maybe a continuing cost for it, et cetera. So it can be very hard. And I talked to a number of legal tech, um, now that we're in, I'm in that field, legal tech entrepreneurs who have different products and services out that have been in this for a long time. And they keep saying, well, we've got these great things that uh, we just don't understand why law firms don't take this up or that up, whatever it is. And I say, well, it's the same reason that frankly, Baker Hughes is a technology company. We come up with a great uh, new tool or a great new service. And it's true for Halliburton and Schlumberger and the, you know, Total or Exxon or whomever. Um, they were happy doing what they're doing the way they're doing it. So sometimes it can take a long time to get certain things come up. But, you know, hydraulic fracturing had been done for a long time. Horizontal drilling had been done for a long time. Um, but until, you know, those were put together and applied at, uh, at scale, people didn't realize what would happen. I was invited in 2012, May of 2012, to speak at the um, OPEC has a, you know, they get together and they set the prices. They set the output quotas, the quotas really. And every three years they do a forum, and it's usually at the uh, May, June meeting in Vienna, because they, they have their place at the Habsburg Palace in Vienna where they meet. And I was invited to go speak to them in 2012, and they didn't put any restriction on. And I was on a, a panel with a lot of other, four other speakers, I guess. And the chair of that was the um, Minister of Energy from Kuwait. Yep. And anyway, I met with our head of technology and said, you know, that presentation you just gave to the board of directors, I'm going to give that in Vienna about hydraulic fracturing and, and uh, horizontal drilling and what that's changing in 2012. And 2012 was still relatively early. And I remember afterwards, the, uh, the uh, minister from Kuwait, literally, he came and he got, got hold of me. He said, so that works, that works, that works. I say, oh yeah, it works. It's going to change things. It's going to work. So technology applied properly and thoughtfully and early can have big differences. And we think that's what arbitrator intelligence will help do in the word of international arbitration. Um, as I mentioned, at, in a company, you've got to see the value and it may take time to get things picked up. But if you see something that works in your firm, you think it will help you do some things. And it's, and it's not just about the faster, cheaper, better. It's about what about the things you're not doing now that you'd be able to do. So it's really learning. And arbitrator intelligence is one thing. And I highly recommend that to you if you're doing, obviously, international arbitration. But there are also other things, and you need somebody at the firm who's interested. You know, I've got bachelor's of mass engineering, so I'm interested in stuff like this. But lots of lawyers say, you know, I don't even like numbers, and I don't like computers. So that may not be the person who should lead it. But you need to have people at the firm or at the company who are thinking about how do we do business, how do we interact, and staying ahead of things so that we all make sure it's still the lawyers making the decisions and not the machines. So do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Yes, so, we do. Okay. So... One of the questions is what challenges have has arbitrator intelligence faced in implementing its technology so far? Well, everything we do uh, technically works fine. So implementation is fine. It's, it's really building inventory so that when you come, you say, um, you know, if you, if you need an African arbitrator, okay, now we have a pretty good database on that. Um, but it's, I analogize it with Catherine. So Catherine, we're, we're building a, um, somewhat of a bespoke um, haberdashery, if you will, or, or sh uh, showroom. And, you know, we have to get the shelves filled because we have something, if everybody wants to have, you know, if it's a woman, everybody wants to have this dress or suit, like say a suit, because men, men and women both wear suits, although not anymore, right? But anyway, um, everybody likes this suit. This is a great suit. I'd like to have that suit. Everything about that suit is something I want. Do you have it in my color? Do you have it the color I like? Do you have it in my size? And that's what we're building now. We have to get enough inventory. So our, our issue right now is getting enough companies signed up, enough law firms signed up, and getting them to take the time to do the IQs for us so that we have the inventory then dispersed to the other um, people who need them. 
So that's why we call it a two-sided market. Our customers are also our suppliers to a great, great part. And that's why as a nonprofit, um, it came about and we saw how that was going to be beneficial. And, and we had firms who were very active, as I said, Wilmer Hale with Gary Bourne and other firms that were on the board. Another question we've had, Alan, is um, how does the, your implementation of the technology or development of the technology differ depending both on the arbitral forum um, as well as the jurisdiction that you're, or the country um, where that arbitrator or you know, the dispute arises from? Uh, well, those are, those are good questions because the, uh, the arbitration institution, the applicable rules, and of course the, the seat of the arbitration, all things you want to know and all things that uh, are in the database. I think I haven't seen all the AIQs, but I think they're always filled in if, if they're known, and I think they are always something to be known. Um, and it, it also gives you the opportunity to see, you know, if we have common law and civil law arbitrators, and we both um, have cases, <laughs> excuse me, which come under, you know, I'm a common law lawyer by training, obviously, but sometimes civil law applies. You know, how are you someone who's able to uh, work well in that? What do, what do the parties think of you in that context? So all those kinds of issues are things we're either capturing now or working to capture consistently. We don't want, we do capture some information that, from the IQ that isn't um, on the, uh, all the reports at the present time because we're capturing things that allow us to build a database that will be able to do a comparative analysis and use for other purposes. Okay. Related. Right. Um, another question we got um, is from this one from Nicholas. Um, can the software prioritize recent experience with an arbitrator, especially an arbitrator who has practiced for 30 plus years? Oh yeah, if, if you go get the reports, it, uh, it gives you, uh, I, th I think it gives you, uh, I'm not sure how the timeline is handled, but you get information so that you know it's, it doesn't just, just say a case that's, um, it turns out it's a 40, 40 year old case. Okay. And um, Alan, I know that uh, this reminded me of, a, of something that you and I talked about separately um, is, it, you know, the, the fact that some companies um, may view using, you know, arbitrator intelligence or some other AI product as a competitive advantage um, in their disputes against others um, and may not want to disclose that they're, you know, they're using it, for example. Um, do, you th do you see scenarios in which um, in, in the future that parties will, will be forced to disclose in some way um, the AI that they, you know, the AI tools that they've been using um, and, and if so, for what reasons? And then um, also if, you know, this AI technology becomes more and more ubiquitous, um, what then becomes a competitive advantage, if any, um, for a company to, um, in using it? Well, well, let me start with the last question. Yeah. Uh, we're, actually, we're actually interested in level, leveling the playing field. I mean, I, uh, uh, I teased uh, Jim Loftus uh, um, last week when he was in the ICDR call. We were talking about, we were talking about AI per se, but we were just talking about information and how you find arbitrators. And you know, I was saying, well, you know, these huge um, aggressive firms, actually, I, used to, I can't remember what the second adjective was, but anyway, these huge monstrous firms um, have their own databases, you know, but they still only have a limited database and may not have it in certain countries. But smaller firms, you can get an international arbitration in a smaller firm, you don't have that same kind of database. So you, know, you start calling around to people and, and you don't have, again, it's not quantitative and comparative data. It's not objective comparative data. So part of what we're, part of the founding mission was to make the level, make it a more level playing field so that, uh, you know, if you're with a big company or a big law firm, you don't get an inherent advantage because the smaller firm can buy the same information. And we think that's a good for the whole, the whole market. Um, so I'm sorry, there were several parts of that question. You may have to repeat the other parts because I, I have a, a, we're passionate about that, frankly, we're passionate about that because that also goes to, you know, arbitrators, I think that will be uh, available and, and become more active in arbitration. Well, actually, l l let me follow up on that, Alan, and, um, uh, and ask you, you know, so if, you know, it seems like there is an incentive, you know, for all parties to an arbitration, um, especially in, you know, the vast majority of complex, high value, trans-border types of disputes, um, where, you know, to, to use this kind of tool, it, it, you know, to bring costs down, 
um, you know, to remove uncertainty from the process, um, you know, and various other benefits. So do you agree, you know, but for it to work effectively, you know, you need the big data there and, and the, you know, the, the larger, the bigger the data set, um, the more varied the data, the better the predictive outcomes and ability of the tool. So if, if that assumption is correct, number one, um, and if it is, then do you see an increased push in the future to making arbitral awards more readily available or, you know, easy, make them easier to be publicly disclosed, at least for the purpose of developing AI tools further and make them more accurate? Um, well, well, they are transparency is increasing. I mean, the ICC has a rule. Uh, when you see the new ICDR rules, you'll, you'll see that's addressed, that uh, the redacted awards, the awards will be uh, published unless party objects within six months. Uh, maybe it's three months, I don't remember what we decided on the, uh, after the reason award comes down. So I think we will see more and more awards, or at least uh, portions of awards, and we'll have more data, and that, that will be good. Um, we, our model right now doesn't require that they become public um, at all, even in a redacted format, because we're getting the information filled out by the lawyers who were there um, for the claimant or respondent, or, or for the company, the actual claimant or respondent, or the firm. Um, so we don't, we don't need that. The uh, investor state awards are already available, but the, they, um, you know, reading the award doesn't give you the information we have, okay? Because we're asking for the um, objective data, but analyzed by the lawyers who were there of the arbitrators. And that's not um, clear in the reason award. You know, I've, I've written some long reason awards, but I've never gotten into <laughs> the discussions that led to are, are exactly anyway you don't you don't get into that kind of stuff so we get we get information that you can't otherwise get uh, so we have investor um, state uh, data uh, which is one of the reasons obviously Canada's uh, signed up uh, as are others in discussions with us in signing up understood so um, we just received a question related to personal uh, to data protection of personally identifiable information um, and what uh, your company's technology does to protect that and whether you see, you know, based on various jurisdictions having, um, you know, more stringent rules regarding personal uh, 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 protection of personally identifiable information than others, um, whether arbitrator intelligence, um, you know, adjusts for that um, depending on jurisdiction. Yeah, we, we have, um, it, it's an area of, of significant focus. It has to be in the international world. Uh, we all know the difference between uh, the European uh, approach to the US approach and other countries are even more stringent. So that's something we're very um, focused on. I'm not an expert in it. I do leave that to others, obviously. As chairman of the board, I try not to be an expert in anything. It's, it's a benefit of being chairman. Um, but kidding aside, uh, we have um, 100 different countries represented now by people who are involved with arbitrator intelligence. And these are actually younger people involved in international arbitration. Some of them work for the countries, the state organizations, some of them work for private law firms. Uh, some of them are not in their home country, uh, but they're very involved because we, Catherine being a teacher has a, a very big focus on helping to bring younger people up. And some of them are doing work from us, for us. Um, so they're, they're paid. And lots of people are involved because we, we do things in addition to just producing the AI cues. And uh, some of that may be discussed on the, the website. I won't go into that because I could, I could spend the rest of the time doing just that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that concludes the uh, questions from our audience, unless anyone else had any last parting thoughts. And, and again, if, if anyone on the call who's in-house, I'll, I'll echo what Alan was saying earlier, um, would be very interested in your thoughts um, you know, for anyone on the call um, who's in-house as to, you know, whether they've had any involvement with AI tools um, in adopting AI tools or encouraging their outside counsel um, to do so and what your experience has been. Um, so if, if anyone does have that experience and is willing to share any insights about that, um, would appreciate that. And in the meantime, I'll, um, I'll ask Alan um, just for any parting thoughts on where he sees um, this technology going in the future um, and, you know, where, how, how you see this playing out in terms of the balance between, um, you know, lawyers using their minds um, and uh, creative abilities um, versus relying more and more on artificial intelligence to, um, to help adjudicate disputes. 
Well, um, you know, there's something I think about a lot, actually. On, and, and let me back up from there and start where I always start, which is um, some of you may know Steve and Lynn Glasser, who had Glasser Legal Works for years, years and then they sold that, uh, that, that uh, trademark, but have been helping with legal education around complex issues for many times. And for the last decade, they've run a bunch of seminars on the business of law. And they've invited me, and I've spoken actually all over the world. Uh, if I could happen to be there anyway, I wouldn't go to just for speak for them, um, even when they offered to pay, because I didn't have the time, frankly. But the business of law is true. There is a business of law. When I went into the legal profession, I went into the profession. And I'm not sure that today, and I gave a speech similar to this when I gave the commencement address at the University of Houston Law School, um, 2013, I guess. And, you know, the, the, the word law and legacy or legal and legacy, you know, are right next to each other in the dictionary. And with our legal training, we have the benefit of a legacy, particularly in the common law, the legacy of how the law comes up. And we help build that legacy or we help um, destroy it, frankly. And while we, you know, we're providing, we're, we're providing commercial services, uh, but they are different. Legal services are different. And we have a particular kind of duty. Um, and it's a duty, you know, because of our ethical duties, our uh, professional duties, uh, to be sure we're following those out and we're encouraging others to follow those and, and to make the profession better, to make it the important part of the country that it's always been in this country in particular because of the rule of law. And not just the rule of law, but a constitutionally based rule of law and rule of law that's um, fair to the other. So I, I think it's very important for us to keep in mind, and particularly as you um, become more senior, as I become more senior, I was used to be proud to be the youngest person in the meetings. So one day I turned around and went, I'm the oldest person in this meeting. And that was uh, true for many years towards the end of Baker Hughes, uh, which is fine. Because uh, with age, hopefully does come wisdom. And I think it also gives perspective. So I encourage all of you to think about the, your professional status and how important it is uh, to reflect on what you know about the law and be sure others who aren't trained in law know that and encourage people to go into law. Um, so uh, because it's the mind of humans, it's going to continue to drive good things or allow bad things to happen. It's not necessarily the machines. The machines are still going to be our servants in one way or the other. Artificial intelligence, as I mentioned, is being used in some bad ways for facial recognition and some good ways. Too, right, to help identify people who have done bad things, but also to help identify people who are disliked by countries like China is, is not necessarily a good thing. I won't go beyond that. I do work with different human rights groups and it's an area we're, we're particularly interested in. Sorry, I, I wandered off, I think. No, no, you that, that's totally fine. No, and uh, well, one um, parting note that I'd just like to add that I found fascinating in, in researching these issues in preparation for today, um, is that um, recently there was a decision out of the, um, let's see, the England and Wales High Court Chancery Div um, Division. Um, the case name is Puro Investments versus MWB Property Limited. And that was the first time, at least in the UK, where um, the, the parties and the court consented to using predictive um, algorithms um, for e-discovery so that the AI that was applied would do would would be the only tool used to determine um, the documents that were considered responsive and relevant to the claims in that case, um, and uh, the results that were generated by that AI um, and the documents identified after the algorithm was fed um, the you know the larger universe of documents, um, the whatever the AI used and um, uh, whatever the AI identified as responsive that's what the um, parties agreed to um, uh, being held by and, and, and used um, in the rest of the case. So I, I found that to be fascinating um, to me, you know, risky <laughs> pursuit to rely on technology for that, but that seems to be where the future is headed and um, something that seems risky today is gonna probably be commonplace, um, you know, very soon. So um, it's, it's an interesting development for sure. You no, know, see, Ben, I think that's just uh, part of the evolution, and it's, and it's nothing we should be afraid of. You know, the old Boolean logic, I don't know if I already said this because I was thinking before I I may have already said it. The old Boolean logic was having sort of a missile. You launch the missile, it was like a missile boomerang. You'd send it out, you'd have a you know, statute of limitations, and within 10 words, tolling. And it would have those hooks on it, and it would go around and 
bring back to you all that from whatever the database was. Sometimes you had to create the database. I spent, as I said, millions of dollars early on um, to have people hand create it. Now you can search because you know things are machine readable. You can search and you can do more and more. So predictive data is just saying, well, you know, if you have those three words, what other words does it sweep up in there? And let's look at those words and see whether we should then do a different kind of search. And that machine can teach itself to do that. We shouldn't be afraid of that. That's you know, it's just an iterative process. So as an engineer, I go, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, people don't have to do that. We can do that. But you need to understand, you need to have somebody who understands the, the logic of it. If you don't understand the logic and that, frankly, because you know, human beings, um, if, if, you, if I say apple, banana, and pear, we all know what the relationship of those are. You know, they're all fruits. We all know certain things. They're succulent fruits. You know, there's things we know. A machine doesn't know that unless it has a lot of data. So you need to understand how the particular artificial intelligence is, is working and what, what the iterations are going to go through. Somebody needs to be doing that for you. And obviously, maybe not somebody in the firm, somebody you hire to be sure. Right. So I'm not afraid of that. I know I have a good friend who's um, um, I've known since she was a junior high school, a friend of our family, who was brilliant, went to Georgetown Law School. She went out, she went to one of the big firms in New York, went into litigation and quit after five years. Um, because they were still doing things in a way that was so mind numbing. She couldn't believe she'd been at the top of her class all her life and was now doing things that were boring. Um, so I'm sure all firms try and avoid that. But you know, to the extent we can avoid that and use our minds more, and that's, I think artificial intelligence can help it. But it's like anything that's um, complex and uh, moving quickly, it can have good and bad sides. And as lawyers, we really need to think about those from a social good stand standpoint. Right. And on that note, Alan, I'll, I'll uh, thank you for your time and, um, and all of your insights and experience on, on this issue. And um, I hope that our audience found it helpful and, um, and come away less afraid of what robots and technology are going to do <laughs> to us lawyers <laughs> in the years to come. Uh, so I appreciate everyone um, who joined the call today. Um, and just a little plug for our uh, upcoming events. Um, after the holidays, um, we will be having a really exciting virtual fireside chat uh, similar to this one uh, with uh, the former Dean of Yale Law School and uh, the former Chief Legal Advisor to the US State Department, Harold Koh, um, on what the results of the US election mean for key issues in international law um, uh, going forward in, in now the Biden administration um, in the next four years. And uh, so I hope you'll join us for that. We'll also be having a panel on doing business in the Middle East um, in January, and uh, hope you will all um, stick around for that too. So um, thank you all for your time and um, happy holidays. And thank you again, Alan, for your time as well. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. See you. Have a good holiday.